Okay, very good afternoon to everyone and thank you so much for joining us. This is the first press conference of EGU 23, the annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. And I'm Gillian D'Souza. I'm the EGU Media and Communications Officer. Um, this year, we've got over 17,000 abstracts submitted to the meeting. So that's a really large number. And we've shortlisted some of the best, most exciting um, abstracts and research papers as our press conferences. So throughout the week, you'll be hearing about the latest developments in the geosciences during the press conferences. And I will be your host for the press briefings, as well as to help you with any media interactions and interviews you'd like to do during the week. Um, each press conference will have time for speakers to make their presentations, which we will then follow with a question and answer round collectively at the end in the last 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so for those of you uh, who are joining us virtually, I would ask that you please mute yourself and we will only take questions at the end of the press conference. So I'm going to now go ahead and introduce all of our panelists to make for faster transitions between them. This press conference is titled, What do Cretaceous Volcanoes, Forensic Criminology and the Finance Sector Have in Common? Water. And our speakers for today are Stephen Graspi from the Geological Survey of Can Canada, Alessandro Gargini from the Department of Biological, Geological and Environmental Sciences, uh, University of Bologna, Italy, and Rick Hochbaum uh, from the University of Twente, Engineering Technology, Water Engineering and Management, the Netherlands. So thank you all of you for joining us and for agreeing to do this press briefing. Uh, we're really eager and excited to hear what you have to share. So we will begin with um, Steve's presentation and then I will cue you in for the next speaker. Thank you everyone and all the best. Thank you. Just trying to get the slides going, I guess. <laughs> Sure. Okay, thanks. All ready to go. Great, thanks. So the title of my presentation and the work I'm doing is Volcanoes, the Gifts That Keep on Giving. And we're looking at the impact of 80 million year old eruptions on the modern environment today. I'll just start by pointing out I'm not wearing a mask here in the photo because of COVID, but it's just to protect myself from the hot sulfuric acid gases that you see in the background. But this isn't a volcano that we, that I'm standing on, but there were shales that were deposited back when the volcano was erupting, and now they're spontaneously burning today. And we're trying to understand the processes of burning and, and the impacts this has in the modern. Maybe next. No. Great. So 80 million years ago, there was large volcanic eruptions that were happening along the west coast of what's now North America. And these were just spewing um, metal rich as as um, ashes into the oceans and depositing into the marine basins at that time. And what you see here is a photo of the shales that were being deposited at the same time. And the volcanoes had an impact of the oceans of depriving it of oxygen, so it became an anoxic environment. And this helped preserve organic matter in the shales. They're very organic rich. And the organic matter also draws the metals that were released from the volcanoes into the shales as well. So we had these very metal rich, organic rich shales that are being deposited at the same time in this very stressed environment 80 million years ago. So you move forward to today, and now these same shales are being weathered and they're spontaneously burning and then they're oxidizing which releases all the metals back into the environment and we're trying to understand then what the broader impacts in the modern environment is of these metals that were deposited 80 million years ago so you can just see in the photo these red acid ponds that are being formed and there's a great quote from uh, armstrong he was one of the people searching for the lost franklin expedition in the arctic in the 1850s and he identified it as sulfuric acid from his taste. So there's a lot wrong with that because first of all, why would you think to taste waters that look like that? And why would you think they even know what sulfuric acid tasted like? But that's his identification back then. Um, next, please. 
So there was an old history with this area, and there's a photo just showing what it looks like in the modern. But the Inuvialuit are the indigenous people in the region, and they have uh, legends of people, um, uh, spirit people that were living in the mountains and having campfires that produced all the smoke. And the people searching for the Franklin expedition uh, had a very similar conclusion that these were campfires and uh, perhaps were the people they're searching for the lost Franklin expedition. But the area is uh, called Igniruat by the Inuvialuit Inuvia uh, people, but uh, also named the Smoking Hills by the people searching for Franklin. Uh, next. And the burning is just a natural process that occurs. And this is a shot you can see of the sort of the shale cliffs that form. And the white lines you can see here, are the ash layers that are produced from the volcanoes that were erupting and get deposited in with the shales. And what happens is that when you have slumping of this rock and it just gets all intermixed together and it gets oxygen into this organic rich shale and then it starts to oxidize and, and produce um, heat and that heat just gets a spontaneous burning going on. So you can see here where the slump has occurred that there's uh, the natural burning process going on, all that smoke that's being produced. And the red is the acid waters that are also being produced. So there's a lot of pyrite, uh, mineral pyrite in these shells, and they're oxidizing and forming these um, acid waters that are processed very similar to modern acid mine drainage. But this is producing some of the most acidic waters in the world. We measure the pH, so fortunately we didn't have to do the taste test like they did in the 1800s, but uh, we measured the pH with a probe and it was some of the lowest uh, pH we ever measured. It's negative 1.44. Um, so it's, it's very acidic waters. It basically is sulfuric acid. So Armstrong was correct, but we just used a more modern way to confirm that. And next, please. But also uh, these waters are just toxic. They're absolutely toxic. Uh, we looked at the uh, concentrations of different metals. And this is just some examples I pulled out to illustrate today. Um, and these are the measured concentrations that we have on the slide. And just to put it into context, I have the percentage above what's considered the safe drinking water standard in Canada. So for copper is 500% above, zinc is 12,000% above, arsenic 19,000, uranium 54,000%, and cadmium 700,000% above the safe drinking guidelines. And the technician who was measuring the waters at the time, she was shocked, has never seen anything like this. And she sent me an email saying, I'm quite convinced you found the exact location of hell and sampled right above it. So it was just to give a good uh, indication of uh, how bad it was. And we're just still remain uncertain about the broader environmental effects of these waters and their pristine Arctic environment. And this is especially important for Nivialuit from communities of Polituk and Taktiaktuk that are nearby that still um, harvest country food from the region. So we're going to go back this summer trying to get a better understanding of what the broader impact of these acid toxic waters are in the broader environment. And then also this whole process again is, is being led by slumping and that's related to permafrost melting. So we also had the question of if we have increased uh, global warming, is that gonna increase the rate of permafrost melt? And is that gonna exasperate this whole process and release even more of these toxic metals into the environment or re-release what these volcanoes deposited 80 million years ago? I'll just end with that. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks so much, Steve. And we will now move to Alessandro's presentation. Yeah. May I have the... Oh, yeah. sorry. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah maybe you'll one. have more luck with it. I, I try to go ahead with this. Sure. The slides. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Alessandro Gargini. I am from the University of Bologna. I am a hydrogeologist, so my topic of research is groundwater. And in this case, the contamination of groundwater. And the title of this presentation that I'm going to make in a few minutes in another room here is about the use of isotopic fingerprinting in order to identify the polluter of two contaminated sites in Italy, in this case. Okay. Uh, why it is important to identify the polluter in contaminated sites? Because you know that both at European and Italian level, there is a very important principle, polluter pays principle. 
the polluter praise principle tells that uh, whoever causes an environmental damage has to bear the cost of the necessary preventive or remedial measures. And this is not important also only for a real environmental disaster, but also to put in danger to induce an environmental disaster against citizens and ecosystems. But many times it's not easy to identify the polluter. So this research explains how in this instance, it was possible to identify the polluter by the use of isotopic fingerprinting. I will present two sites in Italy, one in the Abruzzo region, we are in the central part of Italy, and you see that there is, uh, there is a pointer. Okay, but by the way, there is uh, two rivers, Pescara River and Tirino River, and uh, uh, along the Tirino River, there is a big petrochemical plant, and it was discovered near, in, nearby the petrochemical plant, a old landfill, a illegal dump, where they were discharged some industrial, very dangerous wastes. This is the location of the plant. And uh, along uh, a, a bit more than two kilometers away from the plant, there is a well field. A well field for public water supply to the citizens of Pescara province in the Abruzzo region. So in that case, you have a dump, the source of contamination, you have a plume moving in the groundwater, and you have a receptor represented by the public water supply wells. In the other site, we are in Ferrara, Emilia-Romagna region in northern Italy. And here we have other two dumps, not far, not far from the ancient walls of Ferrara city. And from these two dams, there are, you see some houses, buildings around, two plumes of contamination coming from these two dams are wandering below the houses. And in that case, the hazard is represented by the plume below the houses and the possibility of the inhalation of vapors coming from the plumes. The contaminants are chlorinated solvents, so are contaminants that could move both in the groundwater, in the soluble phase, and can be braved by the inhalation process. We are talking of two compounds, trichloroethylene and perchloroethylene, TCE and PCE, and it's important to know that these two compounds could be derived in two ways, from coal, through the chlorination of acetylene, it's the formation of the commercial product. When you go to the supermarket and buy trialine, the trialine is coming out from this process. But the same two compounds could derive from the thermal chlorination of methane during the pro industrial process of production of chloromethanes. They are the same compounds, the same chemical concentration, the same chemical structure, but the very different is the isotopic signature of the carbon 13 respect to the carbon 12. And this is the example, this is the proof. You see on the Y axis, on the vertical axis, the uh, delta per mil, the concentration of carbon 13 respect to carbon 12. On the X axis, the different boreholes that were sampled, and you have two different signatures, commercial product above, and chlorinated pitches coming from the production of chloromethanes. In these two sites, it was demonstrated in this way that the origin of contamination was derived from the production of chloromethanes, and so it was identified the polluter. And for that reason, the polluter was convicted to be involved in the remediation cost of the site. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. And we will now hear from our virtual speaker, Rick, who will tell us how the finance sector has a role to play in addressing the global water crisis. 
If we can have Rick's slides on, please. Hello. Am I audible? Very clearly. Yep. Thank you. Very clearly. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, thanks for being here uh, and EJU for allowing me the opportunity to present here our latest research. Uh, this is a work that I'll be presenting that I worked on uh, yeah, with uh, Joanna Dobrescu, my colleague over at the Water Footprint Implementation. Um, I'm on my way there. I still had some teaching obligations uh, here in my University of Twente. Uh, I'll be heading for Vienna and I'll be there tomorrow for the presentation. Um, the work that I will be presenting now and tomorrow uh, has not been published yet. We're about to submit it, so let's get that uh, clear. Uh, but we do expect it to make some ripples, and that is because of our main conclusion. And that is that um, our work demonstrates that the world's most powerful investors fall short of assuring water sustainable business practice. So investors fall short of assuring water sustainable business practice. So this might be a slightly different approach from the previous speaker. We don't need uh, an awful lot of technical detail to, uh, to find out who the culprits are of some uh, very harmful activities on water systems. We simply follow the money. Because globally operating banks, uh, pension funds, insurance companies, they allocate, uh, allocate hundreds of trillions of dollars or euros to business activities, businesses and corp corporations from which they do not know whether or not they harm water systems or cause any water-related crises. Uh, what is more, we find that they fail to do so, not just slightly, but by a very large margin, even the best ones, even the front runners. So the simple answer to the question that I posed in the title, is the finance sector a help or a hindrance, is a hindrance. Next slide, please. I assume you will know uh, that humanity at, at large is exerting numerous pressures on crucial earth systems and the climate crisis, of course, is the most known and notable one. Um, but the, the water crises are rapidly gaining momentum too, and rightfully so, because the collective water footprint of humanity is exerting a very large and a growing pressure on earth's systems, on earth's water systems, and it's exceeding critical thresholds. The figures to the left shows that we are already exceeding the green planetary boundary. So that's for green water use. That means that we are disrupting the soil moisture dynamics of Earth. And the map to the right shows you that also the blue planetary boundary that refers to water use from rivers, from lakes, from aquifers, is also being exceeded, namely in all those catchments that are colored orange or red in this map. So even though on a global level, the picture to the left says that for, for blue water, we may not have a problem yet, I think the map shows uh, to the right shows that we actually do have quite some issues in many places. Next slide, please. What this looks like or what this could look like on the ground, these water crises is the following. Uh, we observe depletion of resources. We, we observe water scarcity, destru destruction of aquatic habitats, pollution, competition and conflict over water, water insecurity, just to name a few. And what is also clear is that our water footprint does not only affect water systems directly, it spills over into social, cultural, political, economic domains as well. And in fact, all of the sustainable developments, virtually all, I think you can argue, depend on getting water right. And I just got back actually from another conference, the UN Water Conference, which was held in New York. And there the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, made, I think, a very remarkable speech. Uh, and he stated, as humanity's most precious global common good, water unites us all and it flows across a number of global challenges. That is why water needs to be at the center of the global political agenda. Next slide, please. So how is this relevant for finance? Well, because financial institutions enable a lot of these water harmful activities through their investment practices. They are a very powerful actor, if not the most powerful actor, to realize the SDG agenda. Through their lending, through their investing, their borrowing, their underwriting practices, the finance sector, like no other, steers and shapes the state of Earth's water resources of tomorrow. And how do they do that? Because they enable businesses and corporations to employ activities that use water, that pollute water, in other words, to generate a water footprint and thus contribute to the pressures and the crises. Whether it's your smartphone or your clothes or your coffee or, well, I don't have it here, but even your EGU batch, they all needed water to produce. And behind every producer, 
is an investor. So on the one hand, the paper is predicated on the idea that investors should be held accountable for their investments that enable such adverse water impacts. But on the other hand, you can also see that finance might be a very powerful lever to mitigate some of these crises by steering investments away from detrimental water practices. But we really don't know, it's largely unknown if or to what extent the finance sector is indeed a help or a hindrance in getting these water crises out of the way. So that is what we set up to do with our research, the first in its kind, I would say, by asking the question, to what extent do these financial institutions, institutional investors, include water aspects in their investment policies? And we selected the 50 largest investors worldwide who collectively manage more than 118 trillion US dollars in assets. We meticulously scrutinized all the relevant policy documents that these investors themselves publish, disclose on this topic, and we ranked them using an assessment framework which we developed specifically to this end. Now, just to digest that number of 118 trillion, that is way more than even the GDP of the entire globe. It's, uh, I looked it up, it's 330 times the GDP of Austria, or about 700 times the worth of Elon Musk. So that's a lot of money that they have under their control. Now, if you would go to the next slide, please. In the bar graph to the left here, you see the results of our assessment of these 50 super large investors. And the maximum score that they could reach on water sustainable investment practices is if the bar would extend all the way through the charts to chart to 100%. So what strikes first by just looking at the graph, and that's also our main finding, is that all financial institutions we assessed fall short of assuring water sustainable business practices. And they do so by a margin, right? I mean, even if you just look at the numbers one and two, which is the Norway government pension fund and BNP Paribas, even they barely score above 50% and the rest way below that. So what it means and what we also saw from all these documents that they disclosed is that investors have very limited oversight of the water footprint associated with their investment portfolios, especially when it comes to the value chains of the assets in their portfolio. And a lot of this stems from a lot of ignorance on water on behalf of the, uh, on account of the investors. If they consider water, they typically do so through a risk lens. So meaning will water crises somehow affect our bottom line, but not the other way around. Are our business practices also harming water systems? But in any case, it was a way too narrow perspective on the complex issue as water that we found in their reportings. Next slide, please. So where does that leave us? The implications of the status quo is that, well, first of all, investors don't know the harm that they are enabling uh, because no one knows. They are also not being held accountable for their practices either. And despite that they are so powerful, the sector is not leveraging this power to actually come to a solution to these global water crises. Ergo, investors are a hindrance. But there's a positive side. It does not have to be this way. Financial sectors can be a force for good on water. And our analysis showed that all investors at least disclose some information on water. So it seems to be starting to hit their radar. We also found examples of investors that had good corporate governance structures in place to help the water cause, often because they copied it from the way they addressed the, ca the carbon or the climate crisis. What was also quite pronounced is that there seems to be uh, a leader pack developed within Europe, as European-based investors really gave more attention to the water topic than other geographies. So that might be a good learning opportunity for the other regions. And a big driver of that in Europe, for sure, uh, is a growing awareness of and also a regulation for stopping such unsustainable business uh, practices by corporates, including unsustainable water practices. So that is in a nutshell what we found in this uh, first global assessment on the role of finance. Um, I'm uh, happy to take any questions on this or welcome you at my talk tomorrow. And the details of those are indicated in the last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick, and to all of our speakers for their time today. I think we can all agree they were really insightful presentations. So that brings us to the next part of our press conference, which is the question and answer round. Uh, we will be taking questions from journalists both present in the room and those who've joined us virtually. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will hand over the microphone to you. You can introduce yourself and um, your publication or affiliation, and then let us know which which question you have for which speaker. If you're joining us virtually, you have two options. You can type in your question in the chat 
or you can use the hand raising function on Zoom and you can then ask your question out loud. So over to you now, if you have any questions for our speakers. Thank you. My name is Volker Baumer from TU Dortmund University. I'm uh, just a teaching science journalist. And I have a question to Stephen Gresby. So uh, is, this, is it uh, specific, these type of um, ash and uh, metal for the volcanoes that you are looking on? Or is it something which uh, is uh, getting on all over the world? So is it a specific regional problem? Or are there other hotspots like uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have researched on? Thank you. Yeah, so an uh, issue that we, or area we've seen in northern Canada along the Arctic coastline, and it's, it's one of the questions we have because these same age rocks extend all the way through southern Canada and into the U.S., but this burning process and, and producing of uh, very acid metal rich water seems to be more isolated to the north, and we're not quite sure why. But at the same time of saying that, if we look at um, kind of central Canada, where these same age rocks are, they're all covered by thick glacial till. And, and in that region, there's a lot of issues of, of groundwaters from the till, the glacial sediments that have very high metal contents as well. And these have been somewhat of a mystery. And now I'm starting to think that this could be the same issue is that these metals are being released, but they're just buried by the glacial sediments there that you don't see it. Um, there are similar reports of burning shales on Western Greenland as well, which I believe are the same age as these ones. So the burning kind of process seems to be something a bit more in the north, and we're not entirely sure why. Um, but the metal contents, uh, there's a broader region, um, but it just hasn't been as closely attributed to it because they're all coming up through glacial sediments there. Um, good afternoon. My name is Milan Ilic. I live in Vienna and I uh, write uh, as a correspondent of uh, Delo, the leading Slovenian daily paper from Ljubljana. Uh, I have one question for Mr. Hogeboom, and uh, that is actually many large global multinational corporations, they know that they, their behavior is, let's say, euphemistically suboptimal. Uh, do you think that uh, if you confront them with their um, uh, relation to water problems in the world, that they are going to change the, really to change the behavior, or um, they will try to implement um, their efforts in the, in the greenwashing, uh, what many of them do? Yes, thanks for that question. Um, it's hard to say, of course, what the direction of the entire financial industrial complex will do. But I do think that even though I may have started this whole endeavor also with a, a more skeptical view on would they even change and they are knowingly uh, harming, for instance, water systems, I did come to appreciate that there really is a large knowledge gap with most investors. Uh, they, they don't have a natural engineering or a, let alone a water background often, right? And they also don't really spend the means to get this in place. A lot of the water risks that can play out over the destruction of, uh, for instance, uh, ecosystems that will not affect them in the, the short term that they typically think of. So these are longer cycles, very akin to, to the climate cycles uh, often. So I think that there is on the positive side, a lot of education to do. And once they know the impact that they are causing, then I think there is room for that question. Are you also then going to, well, abide by say a polluter pays principle uh, and, and change your course? And I think there, just as in any other business, there will be a differentiation within the pack where you say some will be front runners who actively uh, take their responsibility and make a change. We, we see that also in the distribution among the scores over the different investors. And some will try to hide it as much as possible or greenwash their way or bluewash their way, which might be a more appropriate term here, uh, bluewash their way out of it. That might very well be. 
Um, I do think that another very important development here is the development of uh, all kinds of regulation, uh, be it on the side of due diligence, so that when companies make investments, they make, need to make sure that they don't, well, not just harm water systems, but also on biodiversity loss or deforestation or labor, th uh, labor topics, um, that they really need to do their due diligence up front, that there are reporting guidelines, so how do they report on their, on their business earnings, uh, that those also include wider sustainability uh, criteria, also on water, and those become increasingly more specific. So even if they don't want to, the regulation seems to be forcing them on multiple fronts uh, to comply. So I don't think that the finance sector will just say, oh, we didn't know we were harming water systems. We'll just you know, do our best now to, to not do so. Um, that will take a while, but I, I, I cho choose to be uh, optimistic in this. And I think that if we even get a few percent of this massive trillions of dollar industry uh, to move the water, the, uh, move just a little bit in a better direction, that can already have quite profound consequences for the health of water systems. Thank you, Rick. We have a follow up question again. I just, sorry, I just signed to with everything is fine. Okay, great. All good. He he was just trying to communicate that he appreciated your response. So thank you. Um, do we have another question coming in? No? Looks like we have no questions from our virtual attendees. Yeah, okay. Hold on. Uh, hello together. My name is Joe Nikos. I'm um, a student of science journalism <laughs> um, in the at, at the Dormant University where Mr. Vormer um, teaches us. And my question is also directed to um, Mr. Hagebohm, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, the virtual participant, <clears throat> um, which is, uh, if it is a realistic concern that access to fresh water could in the future become subject to um, a public um, I don't want to call it a civil war, but uh, very con um, if it has the conflict, uh, the potential to conflict, um, because as you said, the consumption ex um, exceeds already levels that are that would be sustainable. How do you comment on that? Is can I reframe that question as do I foresee a water war erupting or? <laughs> Yeah, I was, um, I'm a bit, bit nervous, I, I apologize. Um, how, how great could the problem of water accessibility become in easier terms? Um, well, I, I suppose there are, I mean, I can try to answer that in, in, in one minute and I can probably lecture about it for five hours uh, because there are so many nuances to it. Um, but in general, we are using way more water than we have sustainably available in many places. And that leads to several problems, and those problems are perceived to be very grave, depending on who you ask. Um, and that water is being used for a variety of purposes, so we need to make very smart decisions who gets to use the available water, given these limits that we have. Uh, those are mostly environmental limits, right? So that if you look at the planetary boundaries, but there's also a lower limit on water, because water is also a human right. And so people also need to have access to the basic needs for washing, for drinking, for cooking, etc. So within that band of a just and a, and a sustainable boundary, we need to make sure that all the activities can take place. And I think that the, that the debates will become much more clear on who takes the water now, who uses it, so who wins and who loses. And if those are big corporations and the investors that are backing them that are the winners, and there are many losers on the side of communities or on the side of the environment or of smaller users, then I think that uh, the first step would be to get the, the transparency in the consumption of water on who wins and on who loses so that the policymaking can also adapt to that. So I, I, I don't think that this is something that will just erupt. It's something that will gradually evolve, evolve where transparency really is key here. And I, I mean, we already see many conflicts over water in, in many places. Yet I also think that water can be a great connector because this means that people have to sit together around the table to make sure that they agree on how the water is being allocated and, and divided amongst the users. So um, 
sure there are geographies where, where the conflict might be uh, a higher risk, but there will also be locations where we can actually have better management uh, because powerful investors are now uh, starting to mingle in the discussion. And that's also maybe maybe that's good to qualify because that's one of, one of the one of the rationales behind the study. Um, Corporations, and I will not name names, right? Uh, but you can all think of the big multinationals, especially those in food and agriculture. They have an incentive to sell as many as many beverages or burgers or whatever they happen to be selling as they can. And if the public asks for um, better uh, better water management in their chains, they may not be too susceptible for that. But when their investors are asking them, "Hey, are you water sustainable?" then they will give a listening ear at the highest levels within their organization. I can assure you. And that is why we also try to pull that lever of finance that they can really influence the companies that they support with their with their finance to to uh, well be better water stewards. Much more to say about that, but I'll keep it at that, I guess. Thanks for your answer. Okay, if we have no more questions coming in, then we are. Okay, to wrap up this press briefing. So thank you once again for um, the speaker's time and availability and to all of you for joining us. Um, I would like to add that the recording of this press conference would be available a couple of hours from now on EGU's YouTube channel. So if you'd like to follow up on that story, um, feel free to do so. Um, if you would also like to request time for interviews or chats with our speakers, then feel free to write to me or just approach us at the press center and we'll try our best to do that. Um, and if you're still around, I would encourage you to join our second press conference today, which is at 3.30. Um, it's the Emirates Mars mission. First results from Damus, which is Mars's mysterious moon. And this is um, the first interplanetary mission by an Arab nation. So that's pretty cool. They have some really exciting images and videos to share with us um, as first looks from the mission. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, everyone, and see you later.